first watch now. What you need to know from the Cochise County Sheriff's Office. Hosted by Cochise County Public Information Officers Carol Kappas and Grady Butler. First watch on 92.3 KWCD. And it's brought to you by Sulphur Springs Valley Electric Cooperative, giving you an inside look into your sheriff's office. I'm Grady Butler, and with me is Sheriff Mark Daniels. Good morning. Hello, everyone. So Carol Kapp is not with us today. She's off doing other things. A little lonely here in the studio right. without our co-pilot. <laughs> yeah. She yeah. called me last night and said, hey, I won't be there, Mom. I said, really? Who's going to do all this? I mean, it's just Grady and I, so we'll get through it. We'll get through it. Well, let's start with football today. So Buena is starting tonight. Actually, a lot of teams are starting tonight. Yeah, everybody in Cochise County is playing tonight, uh, looking at the schedules. And Buena just found out on Tuesday... No, Wednesday, excuse me, Wednesday morning, I was talking to the athletic director, Mr. Deuce. They just found out on Wednesday that Combs High School in Phoenix said, hey, we'll play it. Come to Phoenix, and this is their senior night uh, because it's the only home game Combs is going to have. So, (coughs) excuse me, they've asked Buena, uh, the coach, to travel up to Phoenix and play them. So, Combs High School, you don't, I don't, I've never even heard of them. And uh, even with my wrestling coaching and stuff, I don't know where Combs is at, but uh, not a real strong conference. They were five and five last year. Uh, they did make the playoffs because they won their region. But Buena, uh, Buena should have a good, very good chance starting off the season with a win tonight. And then the rest of the uh, teams, you got Bisbee, Benson, and Tombstone all at home. Uh, and here, here's the thing: I, I encourage you to contact the schools if you want to go watch the games. But I know they're limiting people into the stadium to watch the games. Like every student athlete well, was hurt, told gets two tickets for family or friends. So I don't know if you're going to be able to get in the studio or not, or excuse me, the stadium. Bisbee's at home with um, Sequoia Charter. Uh, Benson's at home with Veritas Prep. And Tombstone's at home with Scottsdale Prep. So, again, a lot of football going on tonight. The only team that I think in the county that's not playing tonight is Douglas. I can't find anything on Douglas. I don't think they kicked off yet their football program this year. But it's good to see that Buena, uh, the Colts, are going to be playing tonight. Uh, next week they travel to Cell Point, And then they have one more game scheduled. Uh, they have to have so many games. I think it's five where... So they can go to the playoffs. They are going to have a state playoffs this year. It's going to be reduced. Everything's modified. This COVID's made everything modified. So I know they're looking for games. They're looking to get a home game. The Tucson Pima area, Vail School District, Tucson TUSD, have not kicked off football. So they're looking to do just like a holiday bowl, when I understand, where they're just going to play in the Tucson. At the end of the year, there's kind of like a little bowl games. So they're not doing the traditional state playoffs. So the whole season's different let me just say and the unexpected is what's driving this and uh, with coven so but least point has got three games we know for sure which is good for the colts and we also got a feel for the high school seniors because you know this is their year to to try to get college scholarships and so it's it's different for them as well it's a whole different arena completely you're 100 percent correct now i was talking to uh one of my wrestler uh mom here last week and 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 this this kid's look. He's a D one player. He's obviously a potential D one player. He's three hundred pounds, six six. I mean, yeah, uh, just a very good athlete. And she's really upset because this is <clears throat> his senior year, and he's not going. The scouts aren't going to be there like they normally are. They're not going to have that traditional ten games where you can go out there and just excel through the season and and embrace that memory of your senior year in football. And he's earned it. He's worked four years to 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 be a. A great football player here for the Colts that you're probably not going to see as much this year. So I still say the opportunities are there. He had a great season last year. I was telling his mom, I said, it'll work out. Life has a way of working it out. And if you can uh, tackle these on the unknowns, it, it'll be a positive thing. Last week we had the Teacher of the Year. We did. And uh, Jackie Clay, our county school superintendent, her team and community members uh, came out. And they just did a, an amazing job in the uh, Cochise County Education Foundation was out there. Uh, Eric Peterman, who's their president, also works at SSVC. Peter Hooper, Frank Gonzalez from Lolly Automotive. J.D. Wallace from G&T Arizona Cooperative. And uh, so many people came out and helped support this for Jackie announced these Teacher of the Year. And what they did, it they did it at the Sears to Mall out in front of the old Sears building. And they lined them up. And then so when they announced their name on stage, they came around and then people honked. It was and waved and clapped. It was just really, you know, in honor of Coven, if you want to call it such. So I got I had the honor of announcing the teacher of the year, which was Leslie Nagalis. She's an eighth grade teacher out of Joyce Clark Middle School here in Sierra Vista. She won it. Uh, just the uh, 
the happiness on her face when she we announced that and she drove through and then she got we her and her family come up and we actually presented an award to her jackie and i did and uh so just just a nice event and i'm i just have so much support for teachers and educators in this in this community and beyond and speaking of jackie clay you had a meeting with her about uh, the jail we did you know jackie has so much passion when it comes to educate in our juveniles and juvenile center and that's i know that's been a topic here recently and that's her passion driving that that's not her being ill she cares about to make sure these kids are uh, provided that education so um her and i met with my jail commander kenny bradshaw here this week in regards to do we have discretionary funding uh, the state gives the jails discretionary funding for the sheriff to spend in programs that he he or she feels best for the jail so we're going to put some more money forward out of our jail enhancement funds to enhance the hours of our teacher and also allow the uh, for the adult education. We have a mandate for juveniles, but for the adult education that we can have uh, GED programs for adults so they can finish their high school diploma under a GED program. So Jackie's got that all set up. Uh, we're putting the money forward to make sure that they have the supplies, uh, the teachers, gonna, they, we pay half the teacher salary. Uh, and so even if somebody gets released, so they start, to, let's say we have somebody as an adult in our jail, they start the GED program and then they get released. Well, they have a year. We'll work with them up to a year to get that. So it's not like, hey, they're gone. Hey, too bad. Next. No, we're going to make sure that we stay connected with this adult based on their willingness and uh, give them the opportunity to get their high school diploma through a GED program. That's a pretty neat program that's happening at our jail. Well, it opens up opportunities. Yeah, opportunities they didn't have. And, and our job in our jail is to safeguard and provide opportunities. We have, uh, thanks to SACA, which is the Southern Arizona Contractor Association, we provide training to those. Anybody that comes in our jail before they're released, they have the opportunity to pick up a sheet, and we provide it to them. Some do, some don't. But it's an opportunity, if you're looking for a job, go see uh, SACA. And that's your contractors around in the in the construction business. They'll tell you they can't find enough people to work. They're looking for people. So if you're looking to go see SACA, Southern Arizona Contractor Association, talk to their staff. So we do those referrals. Plus, they'll come in and actually do training courses for the inmates in our jail. We worked out an agreement with them. So, again, it's just our way of saying how can we help people from not going to jail. And one of the reasons people come to jail is mental health, drug and alcohol issues. And last but not least is financial issues, which drives different aspects of emotions from domestics all the way through so if we can get them uh solidified with a job in, in the county somewhere we're doing really well and we, we we don't want to see them come back to our jail we want to see them become productive in the community so again just another way of doing the ged program supports that too and speaking of the jail uh part of my new duties i've been in the working in the jail for the past two weeks and i want to commend you and uh, commander on the staff there you have an amazing staff inside that jail you know what the best that we do 100% agreed and, and it's nice to see you run around the office doing that and uh, and it's a heck of a learning curve to see what our jail is all about our mm -hmm. three jail operations and uh, addressing the COVID issues and it, it is but one thing that the backbone of that success of those jails is is the employees and you're seeing that already and that comes with a good attitude and I was down there yesterday walking through the jail and talking to uh, the staff down there they're positive they got good attitudes. Uh, they're embracing. And one of the questions I ask them all is, do you like it? you like working here? And the reason I ask them that is that's a hard recruitment for us. It's truly hard to find people that work in that venue where, I mean, it's a tough place to work. I mean, it's a very tough place to work. But we don't have, I want to be clear on that. I mean, we have all um, a diversity of population in there from those that have committed a minor crime that's serving, you know, 24 hour sentence to those that have committed murder. So it's diverse when it comes to the crime, but we don't have the, the outbreaks. We believe in a culture of respect in our jail where we'll treat you with respect. You treat my office, my staff, my officers with respect. But if you violate the rules, there are consequences for that. Truly consequences. And I'll give you an example. We had a, um, a group going through a tour coming through our jail and we were going through, and I looked up one of our, one of the inmates was actually throwing gang signs at the group and, and, and acting inappropriately. So after the tour was done, um, I told the jail commander to address that, and, and then we did. There was consequences for that action, and uh, there he was locked down for a certain amount of time. And, and again, one thing in jails is you're even, this is, sounds unique, is your freedom. The ability to just move around the pod, the ability to... Uh, to socialize when you take that away in a jail i mean that's 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 
tough. So they know those consequences exist. So we don't have the uproars that you see in like maybe Hollywood portrays and this kind of stuff. And not and part of it is too is our diversity. We don't have you know. 90% of all violent criminals are in jail. We have a diverse there. And and since you brought up movies and TV, a lot of times guards are seen as like mean guys that uh, do this, but I actually see them caring about these uh, inmates and, you know, making sure they have what they need. And it's a very neat situation to sit there and watch. Well, from the outside. it is. And, and having passion for your career yeah. is incredible. It, there, there's there's no price tag on that. And that's one thing I see, too, is they truly, truly care about the inmates. You see them. They talk to them. They socialize with them. And think about it. These inmates, they have family. They have moms and dads. I mean, they all have that those emotional draws, too. I don't, I don't care what they're in jail for. So they're actually there to talk to somebody. And when the officer will spend a minute, a couple of minutes, and just listen to them that means a lot it does it truly does and that's where that passion grows and and they're human beings let's, let's never forget that they're human beings that made a mistake that are being held under judicial court orders that our job is to safeguard them and and one thing i gotta say grady you've seen this already is our jail's old mm-hmm. it's 36 years old uh it's a challenge for the way it's designed it's not it is it just doesn't meet um current industry standards and what i mean is there are so many good practices out there that we should be doing but we can't based on the structure of that jail and i'm not saying that anybody's at risk that's not what i'm saying what i am saying is we could do a whole lot better a whole lot better when it comes to how mental health is a prime example uh be having the ability to tour around the country at different jails to include uh fort leavenworth up there their um their facility there's practices and programs that we need to actually adopt here to help our inmates. And I tell people all the time, everybody comes to our jail. Last year, we booked just under 7,000 people in our jail last year, 6,900 or something, just close to 7,000. Everybody's related to somebody in the community. They have a friend, they have a family, a loved one. So think about that as your loved one being in that facility. You want the best facility to take care of their needs, whether it's mental health, whether it's somebody violent that needs to segregate away from the general population, whatever it may be. And our mental health aspect in our jail, we could do 100% better than what we're doing now. And then also things like uh, maintenance inside. Your maintenance crew is is running around the clock in there because of, like, plumbing issues or something like that. But, you know, just keeping the place, you know, up to standards. People don't realize when you have a 36-year-old facility that's, let's put it this way, and I'm I'm not saying this to be mean, there's so much paint on those walls it's become installation. And, uh, (laughs) I mean, seriously, they're thick paint because of all the years of painting it. Uh, to keep it looking good. And I'm all about the look of it because 50% of somebody, how they feel is how it looks and what environment you're in. But so it is our maintenance people. There's two of them that work full time at our jail. And that's all they do is take care of plumbing. We had a huge plumbing issue last year and kudos to that maintenance team to bring that into some kind of resolution. But it's, they're never bored. I can assure you the two busiest maintenance people in the county. I agree. All right. Well, let's uh, head over to uh, Rex Allen days. That's going to be tomorrow. Yes, there's there, a parade. There's a parade tomorrow. Cool. So if you're looking something to do in the morning at 10 o'clock at, in Wilcox, they're having their Rex Allen Day Parade. And uh, and then the following week, we got uh, Benson, um, Butterfield Stage Days, Coach Days. And then after uh, the week after that, we got Hell Dorado and Tombstone. So communities are coming back. And I can see that just by the traffic here in service. Though. Yeah. I think we got all got a little bit uh, complacent in the fact that, hey, this traffic's nice. You come to work. You know, there's not a lot of traffic. Come to work now or go home at 5 o'clock today, and you're going to be stopping at every intersection. I mean, it's bumper to bumper. Time to go adapt back to, hey, our traffic's back. We need to get out and vote, and early voting uh, starts October 7th. It does. And and out of the 79,000 registered voters, Carol left us these stats, so, and this is usually her segment, so we're going to hit that today. But out of the 79,000 registered voters in Cochise County, which is incredible, that's, that's commendable too, 55,000 asked for early ballots. 55,000 asked for early ballots, which tells me those folks that are asking for early ballots, I mean, there's your race right there. I mean, truly, those people are, if everybody voted, I mean, it'll be hard to break once the the tallies come in that night. So you see, and and again, I know there's a lot of controversy on the the mail-in ballots. I'm not going to get into all that, but I'll just say um, there's a lot of early ballots, mail-in ballots coming in. And also early, uh, let's see, you need to register to vote. If you haven't registered to vote, you can still do that by this Monday, October 5th. Yes. 
And you could do that online, and you can do it t- until midnight, October 5th. So get out there, and if you haven't registered to vote, make sure you take care of that. And if you want an early ballot and you're not one of the 55,000, you still have the October 23rd to request that. So I would encourage anybody, if you got any questions about elections, contact the Elections Department, Lisa Morrow over at the County Elections or Dave Stevens, the recorder, uh, reach out and get those answers or go online. You can go online to myarizona.vote and it, it's actually to give you the exact my.arizona.vote and uh, get that information. All right, so get out and vote or register to vote. Just make sure we get our, our votes counted because it's very important. Yeah, it's coming up. I mean, we're down to just a little over a month. And speaking of being counted, since it's 2020, they've extended the dates on that. I've, I saw that. So census, we, you know, we've talked about that a couple of times on the show. And, and just so people, I, I know a lot of people say, I don't want to be counted. I don't want to be involved. It's too much intrusion into my life. And But you can go online and do it. So people won't come to your house if you go online and register uh, and do the census and be counted. But that's $3,000 per person. I mean, think about that. $3,000 per person is what your communities get when it comes to, to provide public safety, education, all the different components of government that help you in a community and provide that uh, those resources. So it's important. It really is. And, and I totally respect the, the thought of intrusion. But, folks, I'm telling you, I mean, go online, fill out your information, how many people live with you, who are with their names, and boom, we move on. It's simple enough. And census workers will not ask for your social security number, bank account info. We've had a couple incidents, I guess, with that popping up, but they will not ask for that information. No, they won't. I mean, this. They're, yes, if that happens, contact the sheriff's office, contact your local law enforcement. Uh, let us know that because something's going on there. And speaking of scams, since we're, we hit on that, is we had a couple. I uh, had a citizen call me this week, uh, DCS, DES, the Department of Economic Security here in the state, he actually received inf- a mail and uh, a card from DES, which means somebody had used his information to file. Unfortunately, well, in this case, fortunately, they mailed it to him, so he knew he was being identity theft, fraud. So he contacts. We looked into that, and uh, I asked him to call DES back and make sure that's clarified with their organization from him, and then we bring awareness back to it. And, uh, and then I had another one this week out of the Palomino area. So, again, keep an eye on your mail. Keep an eye on what's going on. If you see the junk mail, take a look just to make sure before you tear it up and throw it away. That is, it's, and I see that, too. I look through I go through it really fast. But there's so many scams out there. People are trying to get in your bank accounts, get in your personal information, and take money from you. So just guard up on that. Be very, very careful. And if you got a question, go ahead and call the sheriff's office, your local law enforcement, and let us look. Within a few minutes, we can almost tell you, based on what we're dealing with, if it's a scam or not. Um, on this show, we give you an inside look to your sheriff's office, but there's a way you can get some, like, a real good close look with a ride-along program. We do. The Cochise County Sheriff's Office, along with many law enforcement agencies in the county, we have we have a ride-along program, which you come down to your local sheriff's office. Our office and service is actually located right next to the hospital at Colonial Del Salud. But you can come on in, fill out a very quick form. We just verify you're, you're, you're not wanted or you're a fugitive. I mean... So we haven't had that happen where somebody's a fugitive and come rides with us. And they do. It's, a, it's simple. Get in. We take you back to the jail and it's over. But I'm just kidding on that. But long story short, we do. We have a ride-along program. And the reason we have that program is to provide you a firsthand experience on how the deputies work, what it's like to be in a sheriff's car, hear the traffic, see how they operate, see how they handle people. And uh, with all the, the thoughts, the perception, the rumors, and I know there's some facts out there, too. I know that not every cop, there's a small, small percentage in our profession that, listen, they do bad things. And they need to be held accountable. They need to be removed from the profession. And that goes back to leadership. It truly does. But when my career in 36 years, we've done very well with a very talented, passionate group like we talked about, the officers in our jail, my deputies on the road. Uh, I, I'm so impressed with the staff here at the sheriff's office. And But come ride with them. Come ride with them. See what it's all about. Uh, right now, though, we are suspended because of COVID. We're hoping to get that up because, I mean, a lot of my deputies like having the citizens ride with them. They really do. So we'll let you know on this show and on our, on our Facebook. Uh, but once we get that open, come out and ride with the deputies and, and, and spend a shift with them. Uh, the Coaches County Sheriff's Office has a kind of a pilot program with some cameras that are set up along the border. And I understand that we have some big numbers for August. We do. Uh, again, this goes back to our virtual system, uh, working hand-in-hand with our Border Patrol folks and our uh, leadership from Border Patrol. And we have over a 1,000 cameras. We have 
uh, cameras in Cochise County, all through the southern Arizona, into New Mexico, and working with sheriffs on the southwest border, working with our uh, governor, and working with our federal partners. It's all collective for one thing, to enhance that quality of life and help secure our southern border. In August, off our camera system, system alone, we had 1,200 illegals on our cameras. Wow. And, and it's a lot of numbers. It's just off our cameras. And that doesn't include just Cochise County. It's, it's the uh, cameras outside of Cochise County, too. And, but I can tell you this much. You know, we haven't seen this uh, drug load off our cameras or anything I know about in the last two and a half years in our desert, which is amazing. It's, 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 yeah, it's incredible. And the ranchers and the rural folks will tell you that. What we are seeing, though, is the human smuggling. Still organized crime, still cartel-driven. Uh, it's, it's, it's sad. It, to me, it's humanitarian because uh, it's modern-day slavery when it comes to the cartels, you know, taking charge of these humans and trying to bring them across. And $6,000 a head to do that. They get three attempts under the cartel control. And everybody thinks, well, $6,000. I mean, where do they get that kind of money? Well, they don't. They're servant to the cartels. They come into our country. If they do successfully get into our country and they move into a community throughout the United States, they're servant to the cartels, whether it's under a, some kind of labor act, some kind of sex act, you know, um, prostitution, whatever it may be. So there's nothing good about human smuggling. I'm telling you right now. It's modern-day slavery, and then you look at the children involved in that, and that's, that, sh- that should make you sick. So there's a reason we actually work with our Border Patrol partners because when we get a group, Border Patrol gets a group, and we refer the human smuggling to Border Patrol, and and we'll help as much as we can. But once we get them, then we ask them, have you been victimized? And Border Patrol does a very good job with this, too. And if somebody says, yes, I was sexually assaulted or whatever the case may be, then we'll come in and do the investigation on that because it's, it's sad. The cartels do not care about these people. They truly, it's all about a dollar bill and profit. Sad. Earlier this week, we had a 911 d- uh, disruption, and that caused some havoc. It, it truly did. It is on the heels of the incidents going on in Sierra Vista with their shooting. Uh, they had a deceased person behind Walmart. So Sierra Vista Police Department did a very, very good job of investigating that. We assisted them. But in the midst of all that, all that, and you got uh, deputies and high patrol and everybody looking for the suspect vehicle in this shooting uh, to assist Sierra Vista PD, then 911 goes down. So all this going on, I mean, and my credit and my shout-out today is for our our dispatchers, our communicators over at CECOM, Southern Arizona, our Regional Communication Center, because they're doing something. I mean, people are trying to get a hold of them, trying to get information back out to law enforcement without the the assistance of 911. It's frustrating. Uh, Our system right now, 911, is backed up by CenturyLink. It's a statewide contract. We have no control on that here in Cochise County. And so, again, but I understand also talking to sheriffs outside the uh, state of Arizona, we weren't the only state affected, uh, the only area. The governor's officer, office reached out to me and talked to me about our 911 on that the night it, or the day it happened, the night it happened. So, again, it's something we are very attentive to because, you know, that's, that's people's lifeline to us when they need need assistance. And state and federal officials identified the issue as a potential Microsoft system upgrade uh, with a bad patch. So that's what happened there. So it wasn't nefarious. There were no bad guys trying to take it down. No. It's just a, a software glitch. But when somebody's trying to reach 911, they don't care about the glitch. Exactly. They don't care yep. how it happened. They understand, hey, I can't get you. So we respect that. That's just a simple way of putting it. And uh, but, again, we keep an eye on that. We'll come back. We'll follow up. Our CECOM director over there does a very good job of, you know, following up and make sure that doesn't happen again. But, again, there, we're powerless when the fact that we use a private for-profit contractor that provides our backup 911. Also, we had some detention officers graduate, so we want to congratulate them. We did. We had Brennan Linendahl and Claudia Villa. Uh, graduate and just a shout out uh, to both of them to include an next year Brandon Lindahl was the professional uh, graduate for the state nice. I mean he got like MVP if you want to call it right. so I saw him yesterday at the jail one of the reasons I went down there and so congratulations to both of, both of them and special uh, graduation to Brandon Lindahl he's he got hired about six months ago so uh, again it goes back to the quality of people we have going through uh, going to work in our jail all right. What is your safety message of the week before you leave us? Well, the biggest safety message, simply put, is the traffic's back, folks. Normalcy is coming back to 
I, still an abnorm. I mean, you look at our football season, people are like, I want to go to the game, I can't, you know. Um, there's still mass requirements around the county. Bisbee still has theirs. I know Service lifted there, but the organizations, uh, some of the business have not. we got to respect that, is the fact that people are out and about. They're, I've had a lot of people tell me, Sheriff, I'm over the COVID thing. I'm over it. I'm tired of it. I, I get it. I get it. We all get it. And um, But we need to remember, we're all coming back in at the same time. It's like a rush to get in somewhere. And so we just need to slow down. That's the biggest thing I can say. Slow down. Show the respect. I saw a video there at night where it wasn't in our state. I think it was in Florida where it was a road rage. Guy cut him off. Actually bumped him and then cut him off. And he started shooting out the front window shield of his car. And I'm thinking, wow, that's an extreme Pull over, stop, find your emotions, call 911, and let us address it. But don't be shooting at another person from a car. There, There is no winners in that, I promise you. So, again, just slow down and uh, remember respect and remember patience. Also, we need to back up one. Uh, you had the general visit uh, yesterday. Tell oh, us yes. about that. Yes, uh, General Hale. Uh, Brigadier General Hale came down, and we spent a few hours with him and uh, gave him a tour. Gave, and I don't know if people realize this, that if a soldier needs to be incarcerated, they use our jail. A lot of people don't realize that. that. Yeah, we have a contract with the Army that any soldier that's going to be incarcerated, they come to our jail. Now, being a vet, veteran myself, that's always like, I just hate to see soldiers in, within jail, but it's real. And so the general came down, he toured our facility yesterday, and in fact, I just got a text from him a few minutes ago, and uh, very informative. I, I really enjoyed him. He, he's very impressive, I think, and he's community-based. I mean, the guy is just... He's going to be on the show. I told him about our show, and because uh, General Potter has been on the show several times, so because I want to tell me when I can come over. So they're going to hear from General Hale from himself here really soon. But yeah, we just for people know, and just I want to clarify that when we bring a soldier, an active duty soldier or military into our jail, they can't be near any foreign nationals. There's rules that we have to follow to have them in there, and uh, and we abide by those rules, obviously. So again, it's just. A little education for the public so if you ask where the soldiers go they come to cochise county jail so so yeah good visit with the general welcome to cochise county i'm looking forward to a couple years of working with him that's what they last two years and then they move on and and just a shout on that general ashley general ashley was stationed here at fort Wachuca, uh left here just just an amazing general he just retired yesterday oh congratulations uh, head, yeah. yes general ashley robert ashley and his wife barbara and they're heading to north carolina so he uh awesome career he uh, earned his three st- third star and he retired that way and now he's heading to North Carolina to be with family so I wish him well. The Cochise County Sheriff Charity Ride is coming up in November and this year we've kind of changed it up a little bit but it's a great fundraiser. It truly is and, and I got to give a shout out we'll talk here real soon about uh, all our sponsors all our sponsors but um, big shout out to um, American Southwest Credit Union, Brian and his team over there, uh, Lolly's Automotive, Sean and his team over there, they're our partners in this now. So between the Sheriff's Office, the Credit Union, and Lolly's Automotive, we're bringing this to you. And we'll talk about our uh, other sponsors here real soon. But these this year's charities go with Shop with the Cop, Vito's Vets, and Real Wishes Foundation, and that's where the donations will go. I want to thank all the, the businesses that are helping make this happen. Again, I'll shout you out uh, here in the next couple of weeks, but those funds and having lollies and the credit union involved, they pay for all the expenses, like the T-shirts, all the all the things we do, and that allows us everything we collect, every penny collected goes right to these charities. So, again, I'm excited. It's going to be virtual by, I think, next week. When, uh, the week after, we're going to talk a lot of detail about the charity ride. But you can go online. I think it's, what is it, 13th, is it? They can get the 15% discount or October 12th. October 12th. I knew it was That's coming up. Deadline, so yeah. go online to the our, our site and uh, sign up. Yep, early registration is October 12th, and you get 15% off. So do that. You have a little over a week to take care of that. That's right. So, All right, well, thanks for coming and talking to us today, Sheriff Mark Daniels. Thanks, Grady. Everybody have a safe week. It's First Watch on KWCD Country, and it's brought to you by Sulphur Springs Valley Electric Cooperative. The 8th Annual Cochise County Sheriff's Charity Ride is November 7th. This year, Jeeps, motorcycles, and side-by-sides. And you can choose on- or off-road routes. You're encouraged to show your support for America and public safety personnel. Cost is $17 plus $10 per passenger, and kids are $5. Early registration deadline is October 12th, and that gets you 15% off. 100% of the proceeds will go back into our community through Shop with a Cop, Velo Vets, and Real Wishes Foundation. This year, registration 
is online only. Can't make the event? Purchase Charity Ride swag or register online at cochise.az.gov slash sheriff slash charity ride. Special thanks to our presenting sponsors, American Southwest Credit Union and Lolly Automotive. Get more information or register online at cochise.az.gov slash sheriff slash charity ride. It's First Watch Now. Hosted by Public Information Officer Carol Kappas and Grady Butler. On 92.3 KWCD. And it's brought to you by Sulphur Springs Valley Electric Cooperative, giving you an inside look into your sheriff's office. I'm Grady Butler, and in the studio now we have Harry Bowen. Good morning. Good morning. And who are you with today, Harry? I'm with Coaches Serving Veterans, and uh, uh, I'm the chair for the uh, Coach, the CSV, as we could refer to ourselves. And when the Coaches Serving Veterans was first formed, and what organizations are, participated in the structure and process of that development? Okay, in, in 2013, we had uh, the outreach coordinator from the Red Cross out of Tucson who had uh, wanted to... Uh, see if we couldn't do a stand down here uh, the same as they were doing in, in Tucson. So we had the Warrant Officer Association, we had the Air Force, we had the City Council, the Arizona at Work, and uh, quite a few uh, civ- uh, individuals who wanted to uh, join us and just see if they what could do. So in 2014 is when we first started out. Uh, the planning was done in 2013, and we actually started working in 2014. So what is the structure of the Cochise Serving Veterans? Basically, we have the the CSV, which is the Over Umbrella uh, Organization, and then we have two committees uh, that are subservient, and then they uh, have a distinct mission based on and, uh, financial and uh, type of support is actually uh, whether it be one time a year, which is the uh, resource fair, or 365 days where we try to give support, and that's the uh, social services support. And what's your mission? Our mission is to help any needy veteran or their immediate families in uh, obtaining needed uh, services or help, and whether it be uh, through government agencies or whether it be financial or physical. So how's the money distributed within your organization, percentage-wise, like for the income and for the actual helping of veterans? What we have is uh, it comes into the general fund, and then we uh, distribute it according to whether it be for the resource fair uh, or whether it be towards uh, helping someone. And basically, what we have is somewhere around 97%, 98% of that money actually goes to it. The only thing we use it for, the other 2%, is for uh, the administrative costs, like if we need paper, pencils, things like that, advertising, uh, banners, whatever. So you mentioned the resource fair. That's coming up, isn't it? Yes, it is. Normally, we would have had the resource fair uh, the third week in, uh, third Friday in August. However, because of the pandemic, we've had to change it, and it will be held now the 23rd of October, and it will be at the uh, Mall of Sierra Vista. And what are the veterans, uh, when they come, what are they going to get help on? Uh, Everything from benefits, like Social Security, uh, with housing. uh, There's a a myriad of uh, different uh, services where providers come in. Uh, uh, We've got counselors for, for behavioral we have uh, doctors uh, who are there. We have lawyers to give uh, legal advice. We have uh, lawyers who wanted, uh, who just do, uh, you know, like uh, uh, different uh, papers and things like that they need to generate, like a power of attorney, for example. And then we have, uh, uh, we also provide them with uh, a breakfast and a lunch. We give them uh, uh they access the clothing. They get any clothing they want. Uh, they take as many bags as they want. Uh, and then uh, we also have a pet area where we uh, have veterans come in, or uh, veterinarians come in, and they provide actually provide uh, shots. They provide uh, a health examination. And then at the end of it, when they leave, they leave with bags full of dog food or, or cat food, either one. Are there any constraints for participating? Oh, yeah, there's one very big one that's based on the Veterans Administration, and that is they cannot have a, a bad discount. Uh, uh, be, uh, 
if they do, uh, we can't help them. But anything other than bad conduct, we can help them. So give us the dates and times of that one more time. Okay. 23 October, uh, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. with an opening ceremony at 10 a.m. And where is it going to be? And it will be at the mall at Sierra Vista. How can uh, veterans and their families contact you guys? Well, there's a myriad of ways. They can either uh, go in on the uh, uh, website at uh, com, or they can go into Facebook at, at uh, CV, uh, serving, uh, CV, csveterans.com, or you can call, uh, depending on what type of service or help you need. Uh, general, typically that goes to me. Uh, that's at the 970 uh, 549-2312 uh, if it's uh, related to like they've got to know if they can join the, the uh, VRF or something like that, then they'll call uh, the uh, 970 uh, I just lost 970-329-1411 sorry. That's okay. So we appreciate you coming in and talking to us today about Cochise Serving Veterans. And is there anything that the community can do for you? Is there a way to donate? Is there a way to help out? Just get the word, primarily get the word out to any veteran that needs help. And that includes their immediate families. And it doesn't matter whether they are, especially now with the pandemic, uh, impacting employment. Uh, If they uh, need help with their uh, back rent or their... their, uh, uh, utilities or whatever, we can help them, and we will help them. Well, Harry Bowen, we thank you for coming in and talking to us today. It was my pleasure, and I thank you for the opportunity. Coming up next, we're going to hear from Paul Sabino about <laughs> Fire Prevention Week, which is coming up next week. It's First Watch on KWCD Country, and it's brought to you by Sulphur Springs Valley Electric Cooperative. The 8th Annual Cochise County Sheriff's Charity Ride is November 7th. This year, Jeeps, motorcycles, and side-by-sides. And you can choose on- or off-road routes. You're encouraged to show your support for America and public safety personnel. Cost is $17 plus $10 per passenger, and kids are $5. Early registration deadline is October 12th, and that gets you 15% off. 100% of the proceeds will go back into our community through Shop with a Cop, Velo Vets, and Real Wishes Foundation. This year, registration is online only. Can't make the event? Purchase Charity Ride swag or register online at cochise.az.gov slash sheriff slash charity ride. Special thanks to our presenting sponsors, American Southwest Credit Union and Lolly Automotive. Get more information or register online at cochise.az.gov slash sheriff slash charity ride. First Watch Now. Hosted by Public Information Officer Carol Kappas and Grady Butler. On 92.3 KWCD. And it's brought to you by Sulphur Springs Valley Electric Cooperative. I'm Grady Butler. With me is Paul Samino with the Sierra Vista Fire Department. Good morning. Good morning, Grady. So National Fire Prevention Week starts on Monday? Yeah. Okay. And what what is that? Why do we do that every year? Well, uh, you know, we, we have all these commemorations that we do. And unfortunately, this one, Fire Prevention Week, commemorates the Great Chicago Fire, which occurred in 1871. Uh, And think about that year for a moment, because if you think about the construction value and how things went, there was no model building codes, uh, there was no uh, model electrical codes, everything was fuel powered, everything was built of wood. I don't wonder why we had a big fire back in 1871, but uh, it did. And what uh, what that kind of did after that was we had to take things more serious. Uh, this is a fire that burned for days. Uh, it took out uh, over uh, 100,000 people were homeless. Um, over 300 people died as a result of that fire. And uh, think about 17,500 buildings burning uh, and, and, and made out of wood and all that. So it, it was a tremendous fire. You think about the fire suppression, which was kind of like bucket brigades and, and steam engines back there. Uh, it, it, it devastated uh, the city of Chicago for over a week. Now, is it true that a cow started that fire? Uh, you know, what we can say is the fire did originate at Mrs. O'Leary's farm. Right. Uh, the th- thought was, began going back to the fuel, uh, they did have candles and, and lanterns and stuff that were fuel-powered. 
Uh, that that's still out for discussion. <laughs> gotcha. But the thought, the the, the main reason we we're talking about is the fire did originate there, and it did spread to all those buildings and caused great devastation. Now uh, this year you have a theme. Every year you have a theme. So what is the theme this right. year? National Fire Protection Association comes up with a theme, and they use the statistics that we gather throughout the years, and uh, kitchen safety. Uh, is what we are campaigning this year. And uh, the theme is serve up fire safety in the kitchen. I can tell you in the last several months, we've had three fires, uh, kitchen fires, all of them related to unattended cooking. Mm. So, uh, and that is the probably the biggest reason why we have fires in the kitchen. We all have fires at our home, potentially. Heating, cooking, uh, candles, fireplaces, all these are not just, I'm not saying they're all bad, but if we're not paying attention and take responsibility while we're using them, that's when it becomes tragic. So kitchen fires is, right. the, is the big thing. And, right. and, and unattended unattended cooking. Unattended, yeah. uh, think about it. Even with COVID, the holidays are coming up. More people are staying home and eating at home, whether they're taking out, bringing it here. Our, our, the, the traffic to our homes stay c- c- consistent. So I would venture to say that we might have an influx in fire emergencies during the holiday. Thanksgiving being one of those those major days uh, where people get together, there's a lot of cooking going on. So be mindful when you clean your ovens out before you start using them. Um, oven mitts instead of your dish rags to cap hot items. Uh, when you're frying or boiling or whatever, have a lid near the stove. Use the necessary precautions prior to saying, "Oh my gosh, I have a fire." Uh, we want to make sure that we're all all in tune on that. Uh, the other thing is our children. God bless them. Uh, they, they want, they're very curious, very inquisitive. They want to see that, where that smell's coming from. So make sure that if your kitchen, especially in smaller situations, that the kids have at least a buffer from the stoves and hot items uh, because burn injuries are a concern as well, skulls. Let's talk about smoke alarms. Yeah. Uh, most abused appliance in your home because you hang it up and you forget about it. Um, you want to make sure that uh, uh, most manufacturers say 10-year lifespan on it. Uh, we do inspect smoke detectors. We find many that exceed that, and, it, and then you have to go through the expense of replacing them all. But at least what you should do to maintenance it is test it once a month to make sure that it's operating. That little green light that you see in flickering in this detector is basically telling you it's energized. may not tell you it's fully operational. The only way you'll know is to manually test it, push the button, some say hold it for three seconds, see if it activates on interconnected ones that are wired together, all of them will will trigger or activate once you activate one detector. So it's a good way to test them once a month, and then at the end of the year, we always say give you a smoke detector, birthday, replace the batteries. Make it your birthday so it's easy to remember. Sure. That's a way to do it. That's what I do every year. Yeah. Well, let's talk about carbon monoxide alarms. Uh, you see, uh, and especially now that we're, or we're changing the seasons, we're going to be turning off the air conditioning and going to the heating. So most of our fuel-powered heating, gas, uh, portable heaters that are fuel-generated, all will give off carbon monoxide. Uh, so you want to make sure, number one, that you, whatever uh, equipment that you're using is properly maintained, cleaned, and that the flues are nice and tight and everything's evacuating outside of the home and not backing up in. Because that's where your carbon monoxide comes from. Uh, carbon monoxide detectors, uh, when they first came out, were like smoke detectors. They were very costly. Anymore, you can find them combined with a smoke detector. You can have a combination carbon monoxide and smoke detection. And I will tell you, in the model building codes, it is required to have carbon monoxide detectors installed in every home. Now, of course, prevention is the key. That's what we're really preaching here. But let's go worst case scenario. Something happens. You want to have an escape plan. Absolutely. Escape plans. Uh, your home looks very normal to you as you walk in and out. Every, you know the doors. You know every picture on the wall, every, every nail hole in the wall. But in a fire, you introduce smoke, heat, flame, and dare I say anxiety, and everything becomes different. So having that plan and practicing it with your family. Even the most littlest ones, even your toddlers understand, you know, look for mommy and daddy. Let's get out of the house. Let's walk and we're going to stay over here. Having that plan by research says that you will uh, decrease your chances or increase your chances of survival, I should say, in a fire by over 50%. 50%. 
add a smoke detector in there, even go brings it up higher, close to 75%. And then you have sprinkler systems and other types of devices that you can be putting in your home to safeguard you. The, the, the fact is, if you don't have that plan and, and everybody doesn't practice it and understand it, that's when things go wrong. Well, Paul, we thank you for coming in and talking to us today about Fire Prevention Week. We kicks off Monday, and we'll be you'll be hearing PSAs on the radio about it to remind you. But change the batteries in your in your fire detector. That's one thing you can do right now. Right, and we, if I may, uh, we will miss going to the schools because of COVID. Mm. Uh, but uh, you know, and things being what they are with their curriculums, they're already stretched to the limits as it is. We're working on some type of virtual training uh, that we will present to the schools to see if that could be an option. Uh, and because uh, it's not going to wait, fire safety is not going. They don't care whether what we're having, COVID, bad weather, whatever. We still have to be uh, ready, and we're going to do our best to try to uh, get that message out to the public the best we can. A lot of things are being canceled everywhere, as we know in our in our culture. It's just uh, we're not doing events, but we are going to be doing the firefighters Christmas drive, so we can look forward to that because we've already decided that we can do it hands-free, touch-free, and we, that will continue this oh, December. Oh, absolutely, especially our remotes. We, we've we always promoted drive-up service. Mm-hmm. Don't get out, lift your trunk. This this is not going to stop us. And let's face it, uh, based on the type of unemployment and things that are happening economically, I anticipate a higher-than-usual uh, uh influx of people looking for assistance. So I'm looking forward to come on, going out in the community once again and asking them that for their help. And that's going to be the starting in December. You'll start hearing it. You'll start hearing a little bit before, but we're going to hit it hard in December. Uh, the Firefighters Christmas Drive will be, because I've, I've had people ask me, but it will be happening. Absolutely. We're having a meeting right after I leave here. All right. Well, thanks for coming and talking to us today, Paul. Thank you, Grady. Fire Safety Week starts on Monday. Make sure that you are prepared. It's KWCD Country and its first watch brought to you by Sulphur Springs Valley Electric Cooperative. You've been listening to First Watch with the Cochise County Sheriff's Office. Hosted by Cochise County Public Information Officers Carol Kappas and Grady Butler. Join us again next Friday morning, 7 to 8 a.m. First Watch. What you need to know from the Cochise County Sheriff's Office. 